The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. I am Emily Swallow, also known as the Armorer on The Mandalorian. And I'm just giving a little shout out to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast because this is the way. You're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars episode 75. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember... The Force will be with you, always. Hey everyone, I'm Father Andrew Kinstetter, a.k.a. Father Fett, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away, including the deeper themes and meanings. Just a quick reminder to please share the podcast on Twitter or Facebook and leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. This helps us get seen by more people who would be interested in listening to our show. And we always want to uh, find and reach out to new, new listeners. So please, please share the podcast. Today, we are discussing the premiere episode of The Bad Batch, Aftermath, along with episode two, Cut and Run. So joining me today on the panel are, first of all, is Angela Cialana. Howdy, howdy. How's everyone doing? Doing pretty well. Second up is Thomas Sinherho. Hello, hello. It's good to be here. And third and finally this evening is Mike Creevy. Hello, Dex. Did anybody get that reference, by the way? <laughs> uh, now you gotta, now you gotta talk uh, about it. Remember Obi, it's from Father's favorite Star Wars movies, Obi-Wan and the, uh, the 50s diner. Oh, Dex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I thought to myself, I was like, I gotta, I can't uh, say hello there. That's, I always do that. Something else, Obi Wan. That's what came to mind. <laughs> I've started to deep cut. Hello there on on uh, the Secrets of Tech podcast. Every time that I'm on oh, there, oh yeah, uh, can't beat it. Nope it's it's like the the quintessential greeting. <laughs> so this was an exciting week for all of us Star Wars fans. There was a lot that dropped this week because it was May 4th. So we, of course, had our own uh, Facebook Live video podcast, but also there was the release of The Bad Batch. We had episode one and then episode two released on Friday. So this is going to be kind of a double hitter tonight in talking about both of those episodes. Um, so there's there was there's a lot going on. So. Before we jump into the episode, I, I warned you guys I was going to do this, but uh, <laughs> I, I want to know what clone from the Bad Batch do you guys relate to or identify with the most? I, I'd like to say Crosshair, but I'm but I'm definitely Deck. <laughs> That's like a hundred percent me. <laughs> I'm going to go with Hunter because of where you know because of where his arc seems to be going. You know, um, mm. not because I'm a super soldier necessarily. But uh, no, <laughs> you, Thomas, and Andrew I just could think... probably all relate to that. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm sure it's going to come. <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of caught in the middle uh, between tech and Hunter, um, but I'll veer towards tech because of his <laughs> constant analysis of everything. <laughs> uh, that's my personality. My brain is just like always, you know. Uh, what's going on and observing things. So, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the one that sealed it for me in that this week was um, him admiring the chain code thing where he's just like, oh, that, that's a good idea. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, like it's horrible, but it's also really like a great idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was really hoping Angela was going to say Wrecker, but. <laughs> All right. No, sorry, yeah, guys. We'll, we'll have to ask Andrew next next week because I, <laughs> yeah. I, I actually would echo all of you guys. I, I sort of feel like Angela, where I'm kind of between Hunter and Tech. Like I'm definitely techy, analytical, and and uh, I think I'm pretty smart. I don't know if you know everybody else would agree with that, but but then also um, not so much the <laughs> the the father that that Hunter is probably going to grow into, but the leader that he is mm -hmm. as a pastor. I I sort of have those same sort of uh, roles and responsibilities and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I don't identify with Wrecker as much. However, I do have stuffed animals like he does. So 
<laughs> it's a toss-up. <laughs> so, yeah. I think he appeals to the child in all of us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's so definitely. <laughs> so, talking about Aftermath, what what do you guys think? What what's your kind of initial takeaways from from the the long premiere episode of The Bad Batch? Well, first of all, that you got the best cameo ever for our episode <laughs> right before I know. this. Bad I thought batch. the same thing. It was perfect. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was totally uh, divine providence because I had no <laughs> no idea beforehand. And it was it was like minutes. It was minutes after we yeah. got off the you know off the show, and and I I was just like I was really on like cloud nine and everything, and I let's just say I I, I burned out pretty quickly at the end of it because i i can't that's like by far the latest i've stayed up in yeah. months and um but it was just like i'm like well i'm waiting for the show to upload on google drive and my upload speed's not that great so like i'm sitting there i'm like i know it'll probably slow it down if i watch it like, let's do it and so it was like just right away and i was like oh my gosh there he is yeah so and, that and was we had to have exciting. a huge we had to have a huge discussion in my house about the name because the kids were all still trying to think of him as Canaan, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and I was like, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. That's, it was, he was named different when he was a kid and he had to assume a different name when he you know, had to escape from everything. So there was a big talk about that. And so I had to go look it up. Yeah. But I mean, the, the animation was, oh, just fantastic. I kept admiring the depth of field that is now mm. possible um, in this an animation. Um also, just, you know, the the transition between Republic and Empire, getting to see that from different perspectives, um, mm -hmm. from the Kaminoan perspective, that was really interesting. Um, and just overall, the the uh, character of Omega, I really enjoy. Um, she's very intriguing. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing where her story is going to go. Um, uh, but yeah, just really, really great, a treat to watch. Um, and definitely the humor I also appreciate it. So just Star Wars yeah. at its finest, really, when it comes to the animation. Absolutely. I, I have to say that it's a testament to how good the Clone Wars was and the end of the Clone Wars that, uh, watching this scene unfold, you just, you start off in tears like you start mm -hmm. off right holding back that oh gosh they're going to turn on them right now we're going to see that happen and that was um that was it, it was tough it, it was hard to to grapple with i think everybody in my house was like no 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 we're not starting there are we <laughs> well, was, did, did you guys like say it out loud too and like during tom kane's like announcement and it's like depo balaba i'm like oh no because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was like <laughs> like, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will say that it it adds because of the Clone Wars, it added such an emotional impact for that. I mean, granted, mm -hmm. and also knowing yeah. knowing Star Wars Rebels and knowing where where Caleb goes and becomes Kanan. But I I remember the first time that I watched uh, Revenge of the Sith, and when Order sixty six happened, I mean, it was devastating, but it wasn't. It didn't have the emotional punch yeah, that. Right that we saw when uh the the final season of the clone wars and then this there there yeah. was so much more um involved emotionally for me as well with with that and i know there was some stuff online i didn't get to go down the rabbit hole too much but uh, the 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 like jedi body on the the stretcher too did we mm -hmm. it was that shock t or i i heard maybe so... i don't know there was guesses about lightsaber identification in the hand i, I don't know but i right. i couldn't but anyway, yeah. just to say that that's the way that they can, I, I don't, I'm sure they could probably overplay it if they keep going back to it too many times. But so far, I mean, like there's so many different Jedi, there's so many different angles on this that you can tie it in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's been really powerful, I think. Yeah. I, I also really appreciate the, just the, um, you know, we've seen it from one perspective and so the Clone Wars, the final season gave, gave us another perspective. And then this is giving us another perspective. Mm -hmm. And none of them are, in, in my opinion, none of them are too much or, you know, I'm, I'm sick of seeing it. Well, I, I sort of, I don't want to see it, but I'm not <laughs> sick of, of, you know, seeing what, what some of the other characters were doing. And especially after being introduced to these clones in season seven of the Clone Wars. I am I am genuinely curious on on where where they're at during uh, Order sixty six and and where they're going to go. Uh, the other kind of big picture thing that I um, wanted to mention was uh, Kevin Kiner's music 
was mm-hmm. on yeah. point. I mean, just I, I'm never disappointed in the the music quality that I've that I've heard in any of these shows. One other thing that I want to mention, and this is, um, I mean, if you're listening to this uh, episode, you've already seen, you hopefully you've already seen Aftermath, but because um, this is going to kind of get to the end of the episode. But um, what did you guys think of, um, and perhaps we'll talk about it, you know, later on as we get there, but I, what did you think of the reveal as Crosshair as kind of being, becoming the villain, if you will, of the series? I think it's probably the best thing that they could have done to have mm-hmm. a a good villain for this group because Crosshair knows them. Mm-hmm. He knows them from the inside. Um, and I think, you know, um, we also kind of get a sense that there are stakes. You know, if mm-hmm. if they had stayed together as a group after, mm, I guess, this without this situation, you know, the the outcome that came out of it, that Crosshair ended up being loyal to the Empire, if he had kind of or some of them had sort of wavered or had their doubts or I don't know, um, but then everybody ended up staying together. I don't think it would have been quite as strong, but I do appreciate um what they did at first i was kind of wavering like no i want i want him to be a good guy but ultimately Mm -hmm. um i think it was the way to go well i found it funny that that and i sent you guys that link um i know father at least you got to see that was good timing Uh, d bradley baker an awesome like interview about the voices and just seeing him do them yeah is just bizarre but how he talked about how to him you know how they're not it's just so weird. You get to the end and say, D. Bradley Baker is the Bad Batch or whatever has the Bad right. Batch. It's just like, <laughs> how is that? Every time I see it, I'm like, one dude, you know? Yeah. But but he talked about how, for those who haven't seen the clip, uh, I think E put it out. Um, but it was um, him basically saying that he just sort of, it's like he sees these characters. Like, he doesn't really, it, you can see he was almost as surprised about, like, to say it as we are probably to hear it, that it's just like, these are, like, real people to him. Like, it's not the way we think about like just one guy like jumping around voices how do you do that because i don't know how you can keep them straight but just the the trade craft behind it was pretty incredible mm-hmm. and he said the reason i bring that up is because he he mentioned something i th- i think we had all kind of known but like he maybe hadn't thought it specifically but as he's doing the voices and going through them he mentions that uh crosshair is like a coiled snake you know mm-hmm. and has mm-hmm. that raspy and i was like oh yeah i kind of Kind of got that off him, even in, in the uh, uh, Clone Wars season uh, seven, you yeah. know, because I never really I think they did a good job right from the get go. I don't know how far ahead they had this planned, you right. know, because there's been speculation that that was sort of like floating that, you know, with would this work as a show? And I think they got that response. But I wonder if they always had him there as, as sort of if we need to, to go there this is the guy <laughs> where mm. he's not like he's still relatable, you know, but um He's definitely the right one of the group to have go that path, I think. Um, so that'll be yeah. interesting to see what they do with that. Yeah, I was going to say he's the, he's perfect because he's at, in turns the most dangerous, but also the least able to directly affect the group immediately. Right. Right. right so, yeah. you know, he's not the one you want hunting you down. But at the same time, he's not going to be able to to take the leadership role the way that hunter would or tech the group out the way that tech would or just blow stuff up the way that record right. would you know he's he's going to be waiting for that perfect moment to to strike and it's going to be costly and like you're all you you now as as a viewer you have that sitting in the back of your head like waiting like when is crosshair going to show up because that's going to be bad mm-hmm. yeah I think the same could be true on the if you look at it from the opposite perspective that the the bad batch all know crosshair so they are they you know so they even in in episode 2 you know they're already looking for places to go where they th- where they don't think crosshair is going to follow them because they 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 already know how he thinks so mm-hmm. it's it's going to be this yeah interesting game of cat and mouse between the two of them and i i was <laughs> not expecting crosshair to to become the villain in my in my mind as i was watching this episode and as i kind of i think even formed uh an idea of what the show is going to be about i think i sort of equated it to rebels in the sense of the family unit mm. and so to have one of the brothers be like mm. torn mm. from that family unit and then be set up to be the the hunter and the the villain <laughs> i mean it 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 kind of breaks my heart a little bit and and it's supposed to i mean that's that's kind of the mm-hmm. the, the goal here 
Uh, well, it's a so, very different, very different story, but I almost get like a, it's it's some of the same emotional stakes as like the uh, like Edmund and Narnia kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because of that, you know, like he can't. He's not just some bad guy you can wipe out. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's like he's my brother. So what do you do with that? So there, there's all sorts of fun Christian imagery there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and they, and they already well, alluded to the the larger issue of the the clones having that switch turned in their head, right? Where they were turned into these kind of autonomous things and hunters, you know, acute senses picked up on it, right? Where he's coming mm-hmm. back and he's saying they're different and um, tech makes the joke that they're not by bumping into one and asking, mm-hmm. you know, what you need, you need is from and he responds <laughs> the same way you would expect them to. But at the same time they are, and you see that in crosshair, you see that, that change happening and Omega points it out at a mm-hmm. you know really key moment when they're in the, the prison cell. And she yeah. says, you know, I know you're not responsible for what you're doing right now. All right. I know it's not your fault. Right. But and and so I think there's going to be there's some level of that. And then there's also some level of everybody going along with the empire thing. Right. Because, yes, they won the war, but we see the chain code thing happen. We see the way the empire is rising and and you see a resistance force that's kind of pushed into its into what it was from the republic itself so it's it was brother against brother in the the republic versus the federation but now it's even more of that where it's the people that were fighting for the republic are now being forced to fight Mm -hmm. against what was the republic and so it's a really great uh muddying of the waters of the good and evil archetypes that star wars is typically known for and and that's they've been doing a really good job of that and not in the the like you know subversively cheesy way where there is no good or evil but that there is good and evil it's just that everybody gets caught up indifferently (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. you bring up some really good points and we're going to tease out some of those discussions (laughs) later yes Uh, (laughs) uh, very specifically exactly what you talked about and and i and i have uh kind of points where i want to bring that up but I do want to kind of get into at least uh, the summary of this episode because it, it is a long one. So uh, buckle up and hang on for the ride and we'll uh, we'll get through this. So this episode does start off uh, taking place during the events of Revenge of the Sith. And we begin on Kalor with Jedi Master Depa uh, Bilaba. Bilaba? Yeah, that's what yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, and and so this is Caleb Doom, who, of course, later becomes Kanan Jarrus, arrives to tell his master that he brought five clone troopers for support and not a whole army battalion. And this, of course, is the, the fun introduction to Clone Force 99 or the Bad Batch. And the Bad Batch arrives and takes out the droid army. And as uh, the clones begin their counterattack, that's when Emperor Palpatine commands the clones to execute Order 66. And we see Caleb um, watch his master fall to the clones. The Bad Batch themselves are confused by Order 66. And um, as they try to understand it, Hunter chases down Caleb. But Caleb runs away and escapes across this chasm. And Hunter decides to tell the group that Caleb died. But Crosshair immediately from that point is already suspicious and seems to be uneasy with failing to follow the order to kill Caleb. So we've already talked a little bit about um, seeing Caleb in here, which was really cool. Um, I do want to point out, have any of you read the comic Kanan, The Last Padawan? Nope. No. Okay. So it will come up, and I and I actually just read it this afternoon because I wanted to, to refresh my memory. Um, this tells the same story. Um, oh, cool. But differently are there, are, there's differences i heard something about this so a bit. so um yeah because because this kind of goes into the 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 story of same 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 basic thing on caller uh caleb and his master uh but there is no bad batch in the comic at all so the the stories themselves are actually somewhat different in that sense and i thought i read somewhere online where they were I don't know if the the writers or the producers were talking about the difference there and they and they had mentioned that they wanted to to kind of take the spirit of what was given in the comics but then put the bad batch into that. Mm. So kind of just interesting that it's it's the same basic story but there's there's no bad batch. Um and uh I again I think it was cool to to kind of see this play out on screen as opposed to on the comic page. 
Yeah. I, th- I think it's interesting there, like looking at a difference of the story um, and how even inside of uh, Kanan's mind, this would change uh, based on what he experiences from that moment. Right. So you can you could have two different stories. And this mm-hmm. is one of the things that I love about uh canon problems right where you, where you run into a, a situation like this but you then but then you take a step back and remember as someone retells a story uh their facts are different based on their experience so where he found clone troop 99 clone troop 99 came in and saved them all stormtroopers and the entirety of the empire became evil from that point where they turned and there's no rational thought that goes into that especially for a child. Uh, and you see that play out in Kanan's life, right? So you could have a different story from Kanan's perspective mm-hmm. than from, you know, the Bad Batch, which we're getting their perspective now. I think that's a brilliant way to kind of uh, headcanon it, so to speak. Because yeah. the, the, com- <laughs> the, the, the comic itself is actually set during Kanan's time with Hera and the Ghost Crew, and he's remembering what happened mm-hmm. uh 14 years prior so i i yeah i think that's that's cool but it, it and and on a uh just a uh our perspective sort of thing it is kind of fun to just get a different get get a different take on it and and see uh the way that i mean i i think it was appropriate to bring in the bad the bad batch and and getting the cameo from from freddie prince jr um, in the show is actually what I mean, not our cameo, but the cameo in the Bad Batch uh, <laughs> yeah. was was really a surprise and a cool thing to, to to have happen. Which then, of course, prompted Father to send us a meme with Freddie Prince Jr. <laughs> on the poster for <laughs> She's All at at which was pretty <laughs> awesome. Can I ask real quick? I, I don't want to you know go into this too much necessarily, but I, I was just curious your guys' thoughts on it. What did you think about the voice? Because I, I was surprised there was like a big debate about this. Like some people were saying like, oh, it's awesome. Like they 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 like like kind of pitched it up a little bit. And it's like, that's not what I heard. Uh, to me, it just sounded, it sounded like, like Prince Jr. From, just straight. Rep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was OK with it personally, just because like it's him. That's his character. O- only later, I think, was I like, but how old is this kid? But yeah. then it's like, <laughs> I don't know. You know, like you come back, you know, you come back from what, like sixth grade or seventh grade you come back the next fall I was gonna say, he, he just you matured know? early right and like, like i'm still i'm still being called mrs creevy on the phone when people call but like my friends like sound like they're darth vader so i don't know maybe it's just he's 13 who knows so i thought it, it was took fine me out of it a little bit at <laughs> times it. but overall i was like i i wouldn't have anybody else do this voice you know mm-hmm. like it yeah I, I was just thankful that he was able to do it i thought that was really neat was it because we had just seen him and heard him? <laughs> like, honestly, maybe, you know, salt and pepper. Kind of, like, I don't know, but it was cool. I'm just thought I'd ask. <laughs> for, for me, it, it felt more right the second time that I watched the episode. Mm-hmm. Mm, sure. Okay. Yeah. A little, a little kind of jarring off the bat, but yeah, like Angela said, I, you, I wouldn't have wanted anybody else to play that. Uh, so moving on after... Uh, Order 66 happens, uh, the Bad Batch, and I'm just referring to them as the Bad Batch. I don't really know another way to, you know, like, talk about the group. So, either way. One of the producers called them the Batch at one point. The Batch. That's not much shorter. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, because they don't refer to themselves as the Bad Batch. That's kind of like, you know, the the outsiders are referring to them as the Bad Batch because they're the defective clones. They, They would refer to themselves as clone... What is it? Clone, uh, Clone Force, Force. 99. Force 99. 99. So, okay. Either way, that's beside the point. Uh, the Bad Batch do go back to Camino, and they find things uh, a bit different than the last time that they were there. They are informed that the war is over, but things definitely seem off. They see a dead Jedi being carried away. Um, and in their barracks, they continue to discuss how odd things seem. Hunter and Crosshair disagree on executing Order 66. Tech suggests perhaps the regs programming is why they turned on the Jedi and explains um, about the the Camino ca- ca- Caminoans. Dang it, Caminoans. Caminoans. <laughs> the problem is, is it's Camino, so I keep wanting to say like Caminoans. The Camino folk. Cami- Caminoans. Uh, the people on the way. Uh, they. Uh, <laughs> 
They inhibited the cognitive function of the clones to make them obey orders without question. And Tech also suggests that they themselves are likely immune to that programming because of their unique aberrations. And Echo is um, not one of those technically, but he's probably immune because of the injuries that he received on Skako Minor. And he is now practically more machine than man. That was, that was awesome, a great line. <laughs> <laughs> loved, loved them bringing that in. That was really cool. <laughs> uh, Emperor Palpatine's speech is seen um, as seen in Revenge of the Sith is yeah. is happening at the same time, and that's where Palpatine creates the first Galactic Empire, and that's broadcasted to the clones on Kamino as well. Probably Wreck- Wrecker's commentary. Yes. That was like <laughs> one of my favorite moments. And then deformed. You can say that again. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh at that point the regs all cheer and tech makes the comment alluding to the to that being part of the regs programming. Um so so this whole sequence was uh I mean it just continues to kind of set up uh what's what the I mean the bad batch as a as a unique group. And um I thought it was really interesting to see the inside of the barracks where they live. Uh Wrecker has a stuffed animal called Lula. Uh, I was paying attention to that. Um, and, and I really appreciate getting to see the various personalities as they kind of, uh, play, play throughout, uh, each other. Uh, so continuing on the, the bad batch are then introduced to Omega and she is very, very excited to meet them. And she is a child and a medical assistant and she's very intrigued by the bad batch Meanwhile, Admiral Tarkin arrives on Kamino and is very suspicious of the need for future clones. He devises a test for the clones to see their skills, and the Bad Batch are summoned after a food fight in the cafeteria, and we'll get back to that. (laughs) Uh, Tarkin removes the safety protocols in this test and has the droids use live blaster fire, and the Bad Batch succeed, of course, in winning the battle simulation using their unique approach to battle. And Tarkin is intrigued by Clone Force 99, but is very wary of their tendency to disobey orders. And so he decides to test their loyalty and sends them out on a mission to do just that. And they are tasked to neutralize a group of insurgents. And before leaving Kamino, Omega warns Hunter about Tarkin's intentions as she thinks he may have it in for them. So this was, uh, again, another person that I didn't expect to see, Tarkin. Um, and I thought some, some interesting things. So he mentions to, um, the prime minister on Camino that, uh, the, the clone troopers cost more than commissioned soldiers. And I'm pretty sure that this is him trying to stow away money for project Stardust. Hmm. What's that? (laughs) (laughs) The Death Star. It also explains why, uh, the new force is really bad at shooting <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. it's it's um it's also one of those things where I, w- I wonder why you would want to move to a force like that because you have a perfectly aligned uh a perfectly controllable force in your hands right now and and the only thing i was able to come up with is that is that the issue is they are from a single source and that is a failure point right Mm, yeah and so it it, kind of goes hand in hand with this whole movement of cataloging everything and you see the empire is now moving away from just the brute uh winning the war and is trying to move into this situation where they control everything and you take that with uh like some of the hints we get at it in solo and uh some of the view we get from uh, rogue one and you can kind of see where all of this stuff is coming together and what their design is, is their design is more to be the sole source of everything than even to just not, not even to just be in control, but to be the only control, the only option for control. I think it's also to um, kind of infiltrate every, all the different, planets and societies, you know, Mm -hmm. to have loyalties uh, to the empire across, you know, all these different soldiers and their families and so forth. Um, Because we all know that the empire is going to be doing some things that are not so, you know, savory when it comes to uh, respecting people and property and whatnot. (laughs) So um, it it's an added, you know, thing to sort of 
again, like uh, infiltrate the the cultures, the societies, and sort of create the empire as yeah, like a stamp that goes on top of every peoples across the galaxy. Well, and that's a um, kind of dovetailing off what Angela was just saying too. And I, I say this very, <laughs> very carefully. So just in listeners, hear me out. Okay. Technically speaking, uh, and this is something I'll bring up a little bit later too. Just, um, I don't talk about my army experience on here too much, but, but I really want to bring it in later when I talk about more of like the um, relationship with these guys. Cause there's, it's, it's, dead on, you know, but I'll get to that later. But the only thing I want to mention here is with that piece, um, something a lot of people don't realize, I think uh, we use the word propaganda sort of as like an automatically bad word. Um, and it's it's really not. It, it, it's it's a neutral tool that you, you know, you can use. It's like a hammer. You know, if I'm hammering a nail into a board, good. If I'm running after my sister or brother with it when I'm a little kid, bad. You know, like it's, are you, are you utilizing this tool for good or for evil? And the tool specifically is, you know, influence, um, uh, information presentation goal, you know, behavior change as, as a goal. Um, and that was actually one of, that was my, my main uh, specialty in the army. Um, and so, you know, how do you, how do you present a particular message? You know, yes, you can lie and all that, but, but you know, how do you selectively present the message you want to present in order to affect behavior change? And if you have this force that's just to your average person in the galaxy, them, right? Those mm -hmm. clones, those guys, that's one thing. But just like Angela was saying, dead on, like if if your brother's joining up and or your dad's a local moff or, you know, that's when it really starts to get more difficult to kind of maintain your you know, your particular cultural, uh, you know, sort of markers, your your traditions, all those kinds of things, and everything's just getting sucked into this galactic thing across planets, across races, everything else. So obviously, we've seen multiple times, that's a whole other topic in itself, how Star Wars kind of captures that, that, that sort of uh, manipulative, negative, you know, fear driven kind of propaganda. Um and and very much piggybacking off that the way kind of the, the Nazis ultimately had used it because they mm. really knew. I mean, they're second to none, maybe, <laughs> in history with, with how well they utilize that. So I think that is a big piece of it. You know, you want to make this a a galactic thing. You can't just have, you know, these guys from this lab on Camino because they can yeah. maybe be, like, resisted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that that's, that's a, a very good insight into that. I want to talk about uh, the food fight. <laughs> did did any of you guys feel like you were well i've never actually experienced a real food fight uh just <laughs> to, to clarify but did you feel like you were back in junior high like it was so you know, all, all, the, all the outcasts are at the table by themselves and then omega joins them and mm -hmm. but somehow it wasn't cheesy or like it, no. it, it was perfect they they did get called the sad badge <laughs> <laughs> which having having experience with with bullying myself that that was like oh no that struck a yeah. struck a chord with with me um so i was very happy that omega like <laughs> threw the food first and like is gonna stand up for her friends <laughs> what's well, so crosshair sits there through the whole thing right yeah, yeah. Just keeps yep. trying yep. to just keep his head down I don't until he gets hit <laughs> right. yeah and then he's in <laughs> and he just knocks somebody out right away <laughs> Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the lead up to that uh, is something that I, I want to spend some time talking about um, that idea of um, basically the idea between free will or, and it's not really, these aren't, these ideas aren't opposed, but free will and being predisposed to do something. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say programming, but yeah. yeah yep. Yep. So, <laughs> so same thing, um, except for in, in the clone language there, because mm -hmm. um, they're, they're having this discussion about the programming. And, and Wrecker makes the comment, and I just, I love how blunt he is. He says, you know, I like to blow things up because I like to blow things up. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's very, very true. But, you know, that that's a result of his, um, the genetic mutation. And so what I, what I love is, is as what they're teasing out. And even in, in fact, how they're going to treat crosshair later is they're, they're highlighting these aspects of free will and 
pre uh, predisposed to something or, or programming, you know, and and in terms of just human nature and in and, and our human nature, you know, we all have those innate gifts and talents. Um, and even we are predisposed often to act in certain ways because of genetics. You know, there are people who, who might be predisposed to lash out in anger easier than others, you know, or, or you could fill in the blank there on what, what action, uh, you know, you might be predisposed to do, but being predisposed to do something doesn't mean that that's inhibiting your free will. You still have the option to choose to act in such a way that, that is following that or not. So if I'm predisposed to be angry, you know, I can know that and I can then, respond by you know going for a walk taking you know going saying a prayer you know doing some breathing techniques or whatever i need to do i can i can respond contrary to that predisposition and um so so like even record just because he likes to blow things up and he's maybe genetically mutated to be predisposed and programmed to blow things up and do it well that doesn't mean that he is automatically going to do that without a choice in the matter and so I just I really loved this whole this this concept being thrown out there because that's so true to human nature. But then also it throws in the whole idea with the inhibitor chip and what they do with crosshair and the fact that they they force crosshair and all the the regs to follow orders without without question, which is a direct violation of free will and not just a, a predis predisposition to follow orders. So I wanted to kind of know your feel your guys' thoughts on this. I, I thought this was a very awesome theme that they were playing out in this in this episode and probably in this show as well. Yeah, um, I also really noticed that theme very much. Um, another thing that um, at the end of the episode, Wrecker tells Tech, um, don't examine me, I'm not a computer. So he, I think he's very much the voice for that theme. Um, and, uh, ultimately, you know, one of the things that I wrote down was just about, um, that, uh, that conversation with, between Omega and, um, Crosshair when they are, you know, in custody and it, she is such an interesting person because she, I don't know, we can talk about this later, but, you know, is she an empath? Does she, is she able to kind of just, um really have a, a good intuition is she force sensitive but ultimately you know telling him um i know that yeah i know what you're going to do i know it's not your fault you know please don't do it anyway she's still i i thought it was interesting she also said please don't do it even though she kind of knew like i know what you're gonna do but also please don't do it but i know it's not your fault it almost like encapsulated exactly what you're saying, father, that, you know, it's like he is very much predisposed to do this. And we see that when Tarkin is asking about his inhibitor chip and um, he is told that, you know, oh, there's a little bit of an issue there, but, you know, it seems like it's not fully, you know, the way it should be. And it's like, OK, we'll intensify it. Right. And so um, there's this idea that um, I think, too, with people just, you know, in our lives that, you know, there's situations, there's your your background, your formation, right, your mental capacity, whether you've gone through abuse or trauma or whatever that, you know, like you're saying, I think that one thing I appreciate about Catholic morality in particular is that we get that conversation about, you know, that we do have these predispositions and ultimately that does affect how culpable you are for the things that you do. So like somebody who grows up in a really rough, you know, background without a father. And, you know, I'm just thinking about some, I was on a trial, uh, a criminal trial jury, and just thinking about this young person who had done all of these really terrible things, but also you could tell what his background was, you know, and, and just how he felt like he had no other choice. So, you know, all of those things kind of teach us that, yes, people have free will. And at the same time, you know, they are predisposed to do those things. So we need to be understanding of them, just like how Omega was. 
And I think Ricker's also a great voice for this, too, when he says, I like to blow things up because I like to blow things up. It's it's a good example of the difference between a nature and uh, and what you become in that nature. Right. Because Ricker's thing wasn't blowing things up. Ricker's thing was he was big. He he was big and aggressive. That's that's what the, that's the variation that he got as a clone. Right. Hunter's variation was that he got these uh, expanded senses, but he ended up becoming the leader of the group. And and his senses have nothing to do with the fact that he became the leader of the group. You know, Tech is a problem solver, and he could very easily have been a different kind of uh, of technician. You know, he could have been really good at tinkering with things or at mod- modifying things. But instead, he's he likes to solve problems. He likes to look at the big picture, analyze the data, and figure it out. And so you you see here that there is a difference between what you were designed to be and what you choose to do with that or how it expresses itself. You know, it, the, the Catholic term for it might be the gifts you're given and what you choose to do with them. Um, and that's kind of what you see in these guys here is the uniquenesses they have are the gifts that, that pull them away from being the regs, right? And turn them into something impressive. But how they express those gifts is, is, very, is not necessarily just that gift comes out in them, but that they have those unique wants and desires inside of that as well themselves. Yeah. And I think, I mean, um, I wasn't expecting this connection, but, but getting back to Wrecker again with the, <laughs> the, the inflection, you know, the, oh, I like to blow things up because oh, I like to blow, you know, just re- <laughs> and, and it, honestly, the, the weirdest thing in the world, it reminded me of a man for all seasons, not because Thomas Moore reminds me of Wrecker, <laughs> um, but there's 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 that scene where he's talking to uh, uh, the Duke of Norfolk and he's and he's things are starting to kind of heat up, and uh, you know he's 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 talking about the sort of theological implications of this, and and uh, you know Norfolk uh, says to him, he's like, oh yeah, so you believe, you know, just as like a passing, you know, he he couldn't care less about this whole faith thing, and. Um, you know, Sir Thomas says to him, he goes, you know, yes, yes, because I believe or no, not not that I believe, but that I believe, you know, and, and then he's like, I love the line. He's like, I trust I make myself obscure. You know, Norfolk's <laughs> like, perfectly, you know, so he's like, <laughs> oh, here you are splitting hairs. But it's a really incredibly profound moment where it's like there's there's something that you, you know, like you can't you can't define it. I can't define it. Nobody can. You can't put it under a microscope. I, I you know, I am not just the sum total of all the parts that there's this completely out of reach truth about who I am. And, and, and that's because, you know, you are, it's been said many times places, but you know, each one of us is, you know, a word spoken by someone else, you know, so there's, you're not completely, it's that, you know, you're faded, but you're also free. You have destiny but you can completely derail it. It's it's crazy that God made us, <laughs> quite frankly. But I, I love that because it's just to me, it's like I it's likely that, you know, the staff writers or the people writing this show are not trying to make like Catholic theological points. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so beautiful about it is it's like this just is the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, it's completely, you know, um, and, and, and like with Star Wars, you know, these these archetypes, these connections, it's it's just I kept writing down over and over again. This just feels like Star Wars, mm-hmm. you know, through and yeah. through. And so that's I, I think that theme like you can't exhaust that. And I can't wait to see where they go with it because they've hinted, you know, some other folks that we love will will enter into the fray here at <laughs> some point, too. And, you know, where they're at with all this. So. Well, That's all sort, I would add. To sort of bridge between that, the religious and the, the theatrical, I guess you could say, is that word hamartia that we use, which is a word, a Greek word that we use for sin, right? To miss the mark. And that's mm-hmm. also a dramatic and a theatrical um, word that is used right. to describe the uh, sort of the 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 odd choice the bad choice that ultimately is the downfall of a character and i think it's interesting that this character is named crosshair and he is known right. for being on target on target and yeah. yet it is he is the character that is not on target uh right. you know ethically you know in this situation mm-hmm. yeah well yeah and that, well i mean the, but that raises all sorts of questions because because he is this is something that the inhibitor chip is is interfering with that free will 
Because if I if if they hadn't enhanced or intensified the programming, he wouldn't have chosen this. Maybe. So yeah, well, true. <laughs> Very true. He, he was already he was already trending that way before right. yeah. they right. intensified it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he keeps he keeps saying it good soldiers follow you know, follow orders. I'm like, dude, you're creeping me out. <laughs> like, what I, what but I he's did... the only one who says that too, right? The others mm -hmm. aren't walking around with that mantra. Uh, like, where's that coming from? So, um, I knew I just read it. I read it in here in the the comic. Oh, okay. Uh, Kane in the last pad one. It was it was the mantra of the clone troopers that were responding to Order sixty six. So, oh, okay, it, it showed up yeah. in here, and and it okay. and it must be it must be something that that was programmed into them that that's maybe the rationale that they say to themselves. In why they have yeah. to follow yeah. that order, that a good soldier follows in, orders. In the yeah, Clone I have to go back to too, see. Right? It was in the Clone was, Wars too. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say I have to go back to season seven yeah. and see if they're saying that at the end too. I don't know. Uh, it was like earlier when, than that too. Yeah, it, it it popped up at points throughout. There were yeah. there was a couple of different points where it was good soldiers follow orders was kind of there. Uh, they shrug their shoulders and and do mm -hmm. it. You know that's that's one thing. They, I, I remember that being a couple of times where they're like, "Man, good soldiers follow orders," and then they would go off and do something. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head, but I'll I'll, I'll go yeah. back and figure okay. one out. Yeah. So one one of the other just big points that I wanted to make with this is as I like that uh, these these clone troopers are not defined by their uh, kind of their predispositions. You know, so so Thomas, I, I appreciate what you were talking about that like Wrecker, he may have been predisposed to just be big and hit things, but he becomes more than that because, you know, he's able to to choose and to grow and and all of them, you know, have that same sort of experience. And that just I mean, that that says a lot about us as well, which is why I really like it, because even if we are predisposed to get angry easily or if we had you know a really bad background like angela you were you were mentioning um that that person you know just because we have these somewhat predispositions in us that doesn't mean that we're defined by them and that we have the ability to if they're good predispositions to kind of allow them to to build us up and grow with it and become something better or if they're bad Hopefully we have the wisdom and the strength from from God and from those of us around us to help us to, you know, kind of turn away from that or to recognize that and to, to refrain from from acting out in, in those ways. But again, yeah, grow from say. it. It's, it's it's a community effort. It's not something you can do on your own. Well, it's it's the it's the power of grace, because I think Lewis uh, C.S. Lewis says in the four loves or screw tape letters. It's one of those two. I forget where, uh, you know, if you have like a like a he's describing like a like a older Christian lady who's maybe not so nice or, or, or a per, like a like a, a a man, you know, who's 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 Christian, who has these like, you know, angry tendencies or whatever. And he just makes the point like, what would they be like? What if, you know, if they weren't baptized, <laughs> you know, the idea of like, don't don't like so easily write off them as like a uh, write them off as a hypocrite you know uh maybe this is where they're at and they would be in a much worse spot if it weren't for the grace of god so we're not all where we should be at you know yeah, yeah it's definitely a both and i mean there's grace there and the we're members of the body of christ you know the the quickest way for satan to to get us to fall is to make us think that we're isolated and alone you know and so to, to be together in the fight is so much more helpful and stronger. And I mean, I think the Bad Batch, again, sort of exemplify that they're, they're, they're this unit, um, a family unit, a battalion, you know, of, of clone force, but still all the same, they're, they're in the fight together. And then they throw in Omega, which is, I think, part of, of where the, the fun and the drama and the, you know, mystery and um, kind of the growth is going to happen going forward. Uh, so back to back to the episode, we have uh, they the, the the Bad Batch were sent off on this mission to destroy, neutralize, I think neutralize is maybe the right word uh, to neutralize some insurgents. Um, so they land on this planet and Hunter <clears throat> is immediately wary because they don't find any droids, but they 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 find people with children and they have been tasked to eliminate them. And again, we see Crosshair uh, pointing out that this is their mission and they have to do it. 
and Hunter tells them to stand down, at which point they are captured by the insurgents and they realize that they were tasked by Tarkin to take out a to fel- to take out fellow Republic troopers. And they meet with their leaders, so we get another fun cameo here, Saw Guerrera, who uh, refused to fight for the Empire, so he becomes the leader of these these insurgents. Uh, Saw points out that with the Jedi gone and Palpatine in control of the clone army, he basically has command of the entire galaxy. And he makes the comment that the Clone War may have ended, but a civil war is beginning. So that was an appropriate comment to make. He tells Hunter, um, no, uh, Saw then lets the, the Bad Batch leave. And we, again, get more Crosshair kind of grumbling about not finishing the mission. And he does tell Hunter that he may not be fit to lead the squad. They find and shoot down a probe droid and realize that Tarkin was spying on them. And Tech reveals at this point that Omega's insight on Tarkin shouldn't be discounted because she is an enhanced clone like they are. So this was kind of one of those kind of shocking mini revelations, you know, that the five quote unquote uh, altered clones that Nala say mentions didn't include echo because he was the reg, but um, was a reference to Omega. Did, did y'all notice that? Um, and maybe I'm not remembering it right, but uh, tech uses the word enhanced and Hunter keeps using the word defective to refer to their condition as clones. And then ultimately in the next episode is when he's kind of corrected. But um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Um, that totally reminds me of the, it was the, the medical droid. I think when, when, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that was when Echo was hit Easy. over the head, he's like, Oh, I even wrote it down. It was, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, according to your test results, you're all genetic defective clones. I will leave you to process the shock of this revelation. (laughs) (laughs) But you raise it, you raise a good point. Even how they view themselves is going to affect, you know, whether, whether they, you know, grow and, and become something better or whether they kind of isolate and, and kind of turn inward on themselves in sort of a depressed or kind of despair mode, you know, and that's, that's just. You know, if we look at ourselves as broken or as, you know, able to grow in grace and, and you know, be enhanced versus uh, be defective. So let's talk about Omega, because this was kind of this was kind of the, the big one of the big little kind of revelations. Omega. She's a she's a she's a clone. <laughs> at first I was like, is her name Omega like friend in in spanish i was like oh i don't think that's it i knew it was omega well but actually there's something interesting and i didn't think about it till right now but omega is the last she was the last clone that was that was uh created i guess that we know of or what about those little baby clones that we saw sort of in the embryonic type fluid Okay, just that shoot Tarkin down, shoot down at. my hole. <laughs> that was my theory too, though. See, I was but, like, oh, what if she was the last don't, clone? But don't think of it as last, but think of it as pinnacle, right? Like the, she's the ultimate, <laughs> and, and I think that's you know they didn't need to make. Yeah, they were still producing clones, but they did, they weren't tinkering anymore because mm. she's supposed to be that target that they were shooting for, right? Mm. She was she was the thing that the Kaminoans were trying for, and now they have it. At least according to whoever named her. Does anyone seriously not think we're getting Boba Fett in this show? (laughs) Really? You think so? I I don't think so. I really do. Um, But but the only point being that there's been some fun speculation online about like, what what's the. There's some kind of relationship here because, you know, if if she ends up like if she ends up being indeed, you know, somehow. I mean, it, it seems like like she's she's somehow from this this the same just a modification of the same strand or whatever from from Django um, because of her connection with them because that's what they all are. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> I can't even remember what like second cousin twice removed means. Like I always get all that mixed up. So I don't know what what this makes them. But yeah, it's interesting just to see where this goes with her because of her like clearly she has that shot. Um you know, in the bay there with, with crosshair, 
which was interesting to have, you know, like to, to introduce that mystery about her by having her contend with him with a thing he's best at mm-hmm. for the first time she's ever tried it. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of raising a lot of questions for me, of course, like what, how many skills of them collectively does she have, you know, or, or could she have, you know, so uh, but I, I really agree. I've, I've been reading up on a, you know, a lot of people's reactions to her. And I just really think like I, I tend to agree with the, the folks who are pointing out that like it's so easy to just do the same old thing again or to have it be like the annoying kid who's in the way or, you know, like there's so many tropes that even if you didn't want to, you could slip into and right from the very get go with her. She's just totally not that she's completely unique. I, I'm truly just, I think she's just this charming, wonderful, uh, character. And, um, I don't really think it's just trying to mimic Mandalorian. I think there's, there's similar beats there, but it's, it's, it's different. And, uh, for me, you know, as a dad specifically of girls, I, I'm really enjoying this. So I was just watching this with Noelle the other day, and even she's like, she kind of looks like me. <laughs> you know, <I> was like, <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, so she's 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 interested. So I'm I'm excited for all this stuff to to unfold. I I think I'm I'm struggling still with her after the first episode. So the the aftermath was great, and I thought it was really awesome. I thought that she was you know she's a firebrand. She's got this kind of unique uh, skill set to her. We we still want to find out who she is. And then the first episode, uh, the it, it painted her as a kid in so so stark contrast to this highly proficient troublemaker that she was um you know on this on the Kaminoan station that it was like ah i don't know i don't know i'm i'm holding judgment until i see more of this but it like it kind of threw the character in in the just actual episode as opposed to the the kind of pilot uh, series i think some of the she was just really out of her element was my take on it yeah. you know like she's never been anywhere you know yeah i i think i kind of go on mike's uh road of road of thought too because on camino like she would have known everything she or i mean as much as as much as she could so she was competent she was familiar she was comfortable um even with a blaster even if she'd never uh shot one before uh and and i actually i really yeah i guess i i don't really know how i'm feeling about it yet either i i i really liked episode two where where she so actually, Mike, I thought of you totally like when she steps <laughs> off the, the the um, she steps off the, the ship and like encounters dirt. And <laughs> so what I mean by that was you have this this ability and um, uh, way of speaking about awe and wonder. And I did think of that. <laughs> and I and I really appreciated Omega like finding dirt and just thinking it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Cause I just, I, yeah, I'd never yeah. thought about it. Like if you'd grow up on Camino, you have rain 24 yeah. seven, you've never right. encountered dirt, <laughs> you no, know, no sunshine. Yeah. She's like, what's so this? Her, her on <laughs> wonder was, was a, a really nice thing to throw in there. I thought. Yeah. So, and yeah, I guess we'll see where, think... where, where her character goes, but. I was just going to say the thing that most intrigues me about her is how she is very, at, at the very least, she's very intuitive. Like she, had this intuition about Tarkin. She said it's not it's not safe here anymore. He doesn't like clones. He never said he doesn't like clones in front of her. And then, you know, when Crosshair's like on the other side of the gate uh door thing, um, the hangar door opens and you see Crosshair. But before that she says, Oh, I don't think we'll have to go far to find Crosshair. So she has this kind of intuition about people in particular um that i find really fascinating so i mm-hmm. want to know what is that is that programming how do you program that is did they find a way to kind of engineer a force sensitive clone or you know wh- what is the scenario so or and i, I don't want to i don't think it'll go this way and i'm not sure i even want to broach this kind of thought but what if there's something sinister there like what if she has some program you know in her that could be activated later on in the show that i don't know i 
I don't think they'll go there, but I mean that that she is a clone just like the rest of them, so she could have some. On the flip side, though, the the Kaminoans. I'm gonna never say that right. <laughs> I should just stop trying. Uh, the people of Camino. <laughs> yeah. uh, they even help them escape, though. So, so like, yeah, even they seem to be sort of, you know, not on the same side as Tarkin and maybe the Empire. And so, I, well, I guess the clones are their property. Yeah, and they've invested a lot of time and energy into in engineering those clones, so they don't want to lose those clones. So that's kind of that's another way of looking at it. Is like they could be like, oh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, go free and live your life. But <laughs> I think it was more of kind of like, oh, uh, let's keep this True. on the down low. <laughs> yeah. Well, and some some of the online chatter was also bringing up um, a, a curious question because you know, do the do the Kaminoans? Do they know? I don't know how good their intel is, but you know, do they know what happened on Geonosis? Right. <laughs> you know, as far as like when you're not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 someone else pointed out too that um, I forget exactly where I heard it, but they pointed out something I had forgotten since episode two because Camino, as far as we know, is still a secretive planet that's been removed from the database too. So it's like, who would even know that they were gone? You know, so that uh, right. that was a little like they, I, you know, it doesn't take a genius to know that Tarkin represents some pretty nefarious. You know, we're gonna, you know, we'll we'll drop you the moment it's convenient. So who knows what they have up their sleeve? You know, and they have long sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's they have very long sleeves. Very long, <laughs> very long lens, and you know, <laughs> so lame. That was yeah. such a dad joke, Mike. <laughs> oh, I can't help it. I torture my students every day with this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, let's uh, kind of conclude, I guess, aftermath at this point. And we've sort of already kind of talked around a lot of these things. But uh, after they encountered Saw Gerrera, the Bad Batch go back to Camino to, to get Omega. And they are all captured and thrown into the brig, where, of course, that's where o Omega was uh, to begin with because she had been caught earlier. And uh, this is at a point where Crosshair continues to say that good soldiers follow orders. So that was, again, that, that kind of mantra there for, for him and um, critiquing Hunter and his decisions. And they, uh, the, the troopers take Crosshair and they intensify his inhibitor chip and it's successful. And meanwhile, the, the Bad Batch uh, is in the brig and they escape uh, by using Wrecker's strength and Omega's small stature to break break through the wall and uh, hit the cell release. And then in the hangar, that's where all their gear is, and so the Bad Batch manage to get into the hangar and get their gear back, and that's where con they're confronted by Crosshair, and that's where Omega exhibits some skills that she didn't know she had by, by being able to, to shoot and hit Crosshair's gun. And they all do escape, and they are going to go look for um, someone that they know who can help them try to kind of lay low. They they know a guy, uh, quote unquote. I just want to mention one thing real quick. It's something Angela mentioned earlier, but that scene, especially in the the bay, all I wanted to mention is just the it's so artistic, and like you mm -hmm. said too, like the depth of field and stuff. And I don't know if you guys noticed the. I have to go back and check, but the skin texture like and i just texture. kept thinking like it mm -hmm. it looks like a it looks like a painting mm -hmm. you know, like it looks mm -hmm. like brush strokes yeah on the face and it's just yeah so that's all i wanted to add is just so artistic you know like like uh, um what it reminded me of like the standoff between hunter and crosshair really reminded me of the standoff between ahsoka and maul at the end of season mm -hmm. seven like it had that same kind of just artistic really like letting you soak that up anything else on aftermath before we jump into to episode two um, well, I saw a lot of connections between the two episodes, mm -hmm. actually, um, thematically, um, you know, the idea of loyalty, like friendship or family or team versus servitude, you know, with the Empire having to make that choice and Omega very much feeling like she is a family member with CF-99, even though, you know, at first they didn't know her, but she knew them. Um, also creativity versus order, um, or control, um, where Clone Force 99 is very much about, you know, 
uh, improvising, right, to come up with their 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 win, their victory, um, and it's it's different from what the empire expects. Um, and then I th- I just thought it was interesting too that um, we got with Saw Guerrera, we got the seed planted about refugees that there are refugees because of the empire being created and um that we get that again that theme in the next episode with cut and his family um a couple random points for me these aren't necessarily discussion points but they were fun quotes that i really appreciated uh at one point uh there the bad batch is is talking about tarkin's evaluation and Tech makes the comment that he says, I hope that it's not mental because clearly we'd never pass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Appreciated that comment. Poor Tech. <laughs> um, also, I really liked in the, the battle simulation when they, they begin to use the live uh, rounds. And so Hunter makes the call to, to do something different and he uses the hand signals and Wrecker is... <laughs> lost. completely lost <laughs> it takes like it would help if you learned that <laughs> right. uh, he's like you memorize him he's like i do i i have memorized him. oh uh, so yeah overall i thought that was a, a fantastic episode so we will uh, actually mike you had mentioned and i don't know if you wanted to come back to this later but you had mentioned you wanted to talk a little bit about the relationships between the the, the bad oh, Batch yeah. characters I, just just quick you know a general statement that it's just so uh, you know like it's not like only people who have been in the military could at least you know kind of get this impression but just you know, having experienced it myself you know firsthand in, in, in my late teens and 20s and until i was about 30 uh when i got out it's just so funny that you <laughs> the 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 way that you just sort of live military sort of diversity and variety where it's it's there's no question about it like you had like you know, people from all over the place you know every accent you can imagine every you know just different personality types and you know there are common some common you know interests that kind of stuff you know but but there's more variety than i think people realize sometimes and it's always really funny especially when you've like when you're joining a unit for the first time or even going to training just for a few weeks and then you have your first event where you all like meet up in civilian clothes and that's always funny because it's like, oh, you're a leather guy. <laughs> like, uh, like, OK, or she, you know, and, and you know, or, or the, the, you know, um, some of like the the female soldiers who, you know, just there's there's so many obviously like um, uniform protocols for for everybody and everything. And like they'll show up and their hair is all done and makeup and like you don't even recognize her at first kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And just like, oh, yeah, I was sitting next to you all day today. I'm so sorry. You know, but but just with these guys, I laugh so hard because it's just it's it's so endearing of, of it's not a, tr- it's not a trope. Like everyone's, it's like the A team and everything it is, but it really is like that too. <laughs> with Like, you know, all these people and you're kind of stuck together and like, you just, you gotta work stuff out, mm. you know? Cause like, where are you going to go? I mean, like, <laughs> it's just like you're, you know, you're thrown together and now you're, you're all um, uh, with this variety, this diversity, but it's for a re like a reason, a, a, a mission. And I can't help but think of, you know, one, one body, many parts, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and so the the wrecker cannot say to the you know, to the tech, <laughs> "I have no need of you." You know, it is it's it's hilarious how many connections I, I can't help but see, and you know, scripturally, militarily, it's, it's just it's fun. I love mm-hmm. I love this kind of Star Wars a lot. I think the same could be said about seminary experience, like being oh, yeah. thrown in with, with a bunch of guys, and like you, sure. even even if you you know don't necessarily get along, you got to learn to live together, and and you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some some good good parallels parallels there, or religious life in general. I guess men and female, but my experience, of course, is is seminary. Uh, so talking then about episode two, uh, episode two. Here is a well, as brief as I can do these sorts of recaps. Uh, uh, the Bad Batch lands on the planet Salukamai, where they they meet Cut and Sue on a farm. And Cut is a former clone trooper who deserted, as seen in the Clone Wars Season 2, Episode 10. Uh, Rex had passed through the day prior and had told Cut and Sue about the the clone troopers turning turning on the Jedi and was talking about the inhibitor chip, at which point Omega tells them that they were put in all the clones to modify their behavior. 
We get some cool uh, kind of encounters between uh, Cut and Sue's kids as they're happy to see Uncle Wrecker, which was a, a fun <laughs> moment. Uh, and they play with Omega, who doesn't even know how to play. And so they they talk about the situation, and Cut wants to book a transport for his family to get off world as it's not safe. And the Empire is even then seizing ships and forcing everyone to register for a unique chain code in order to book passage or exchange currency for Imperial credits. Omega, um, again, kind of shows her ignorance and she goes after a ball and she gets attacked by a, a Nexu creature. <laughs> and uh, they, of course, save her. But we have this dilemma set up that Hunter is treating Omega like a soldier and not like a kid. And so that will kind of play off later, I'm sure. Meanwhile, they come up with the the plan to sneak into the security station and um, replicate some of the chain codes, and they get the ship impounded in order to do that, unintentionally with Omega on board, and Omega proves herself, and as they steal the, the, the chain codes and the, the blank disks, uh, she is able to take the duplicated chain codes and manages to get them delivered while Echo and Tech start a blaster fire as they're trying to free their ship, which, of course, they ultimately uh, succeed in freeing their ship. And Omega, initially, Hunter was going to send her with Cut and Sue as they left the planet, but she decides to to stay back and to make her presence uh, on the ship with the Bad Batch. And Hunter and Omega both acknowledge that they both have a lot to learn. And so that's... Um, kind of it in a nutshell, but um, there was a lot going on in in this particular episode, and and at least from from my perspective, uh, it was I, I feel like we're still kind of laying the groundwork for this new crew, yeah. You know the, yeah. the new the new mm -hmm. family, if you will, you know, including Omega. So that this my, was my wife was worried that this is going to turn into three men and a baby. Like <laughs> she was she was like I I, yeah. I really hope that they pull themselves out of that because <laughs> it's kind of looking that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I, and that's where I think, you know, Omega seeing her in the first episode is kind of more competent. Uh, mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. we get kind of that, that back a little bit as she's kind yeah. of growing in herself and not just being kind of the, the kid that they don't know how to take care of. Well, and I think, you know, there's for, uh, and I'm one of them that, that tends to think that there, like I said earlier, there's going to be some sort of combo thing with her abilities or some sort of amalgam mm -hmm. of the others maybe i started to doubt that a little bit though when when i was like well she might not have any of hunter's skills because the next <laughs> is like right there she is no but then again like she's never seen an animal before mm -hmm. or, you know i don't know mm -hmm. like just no practice maybe i thought it was um, funny that like they're they're gonna play catch and she didn't even realize that she was supposed to catch the ball yeah. Right. So like, she's like dancing around with him and then it just goes right by her. <laughs> she's like, what is the purpose of this? <laughs> to have fun. Yeah. And and I think that, that that was maybe more of kind of the, the subplot going on, of course. Uh, it was more uh, some of the bigger issues that I that I think that they touched on, which was which was really good, was um kind of dealing with the chain codes. And so I, I, I liked, you know, that they that they touched on that. I actually went back and watched uh, season two, episode 10 of the Clone Wars to to see Cut and Sue in there as they were introduced back in season two. And and one of the things that I thought it was really interesting going back to watch that, because one of the things that um, so Rex gets wounded and he has to go to um, he basically is is taken to, to Cut's barn and where he can heal and and Cut. Uh, comes in and and um, they, they start to talk, but one of the things that that Cut mentions is he asks Rex what his what his number is, and Rex uh, tells him that his name is Rex, and so they make the point in that episode that Rex has a name, not just a number, and Rex responds to that in that he says that it, it actually makes them more efficient, and so. What I what I get from that, though, is that it makes them more efficient because it makes them relatable and you you trust someone more when you when you have a relationship with them and you're not just a number. But you have that sort of juxtaposed with what the Empire is doing now by forcing everyone to, to kind of uh, register and become a number and not and no longer just a, a person with an identity. 
So this is kind of the empire on display. What do you guys think? Couldn't help but think of my own social security number, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, There's I, a lot of parallels, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought of the, um, just the, well, one thing that actually came to mind was closer to the end when they're all kind of waiting and there's that, that, that nervousness like of them approaching the checkpoint. I thought that was actually a pretty interesting, uh, very solo esque kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like you can very, yes. e- you can very yeah. easily imagine like where this is going to be like in 10 years, you know, cause that's when solo is basically. So, you know, like the beginnings of that and they're already pretty good at it. Um, and I love Tech's line, you know, about that, you know, just the passing line about like, I think it was Tech, didn't you, that said that it's interesting that the clones spent so long, you know, trying to basically have names and now everybody wants to be a number. And, you know, that that it was. Yeah. So a lot of interesting food for thought, you mm-hmm. know, I, I like that the bureaucracy of the Empire is kind of the, you know, the hammer is falling already. Right. Yeah. Like that's that's the way they win is just by just that bureaucracy red tape and uh everything has everything's codified everything is the way it's supposed to be and then um i i also like too that it it, we've seen a chain code and the chain code that we've seen was boba fett's Mm -hmm. which is a a really Mm -hmm. interesting look at what the chain code is because it's like it's not just a, a number but it's actually the genealogy of the person that that is there and then you kind of rewind that and you look at uh, the solo event of it where, you know, they don't use a chain code They're They're supposed to give their chain code to go through the, the checkpoint, but then they put the, uh, the, I don't remember what it was, the unobtainium, whatever coaxium. it was. Coaxium. The coaxium. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they put that in to, to kind of bribe their way through. And then when he's registering for the Navy, um, the, the registrant asks him, you know, what's, what's your name? Who are your people? And he says, I, I don't know. I'm by myself. And, and that's how he gets the name solo. So his chain code is kind of developed on the fly right there at that moment. So it's, it's really like when you start to get really deep into the star Wars and you get all these pieces and start putting them together, it's a, such an interesting view of what the empire is and what they're for, what they stand for. Yeah. I was going to say that um, one of the things that I, uh, sort of the the theme uh was control versus care because mm-hmm. we saw the empire in the the macro you know level and then versus a family you know and a team and we see that with hunter uh you know kind of reprimanding omega whereas cut comes in more like a father you know like the care versus the control that a soldier might be used to on a battlefield so um that was kind of the way that i saw them sort of setting up this episode um in in on the macro level um but you know the idea of uh, sue kept bringing this up and i wanted to get the father's perspective Um, that she kept saying that kids will find trouble. And (laughs) I was wondering where you thought that really kind of like, why did they keep driving home that point? You know, besides, was it maybe like part of just developing Hunter's character, you know, like informing him of what to expect or sort of telegraphing to us, like what, what we should expect in the future? I think it's because even because it's a fantasy show, it's like the real world needs to, like, get in and tell Hunter what's coming. Right. (laughs) It's like, dude, it's like, dude, I don't want to rain on your Star Wars party here, but just get ready. So, (laughs) well, and and it seemed to be definitely Hunter. (laughs) He's he's not a father. You know, but he's now being kind of more or less thrown into that that role. You know, similarly, like Din Djarin was with Grogu, but uh, you know, and, and so it, it seemed to me that like he needed to be reminded that basically kids will be kids. And, and, and because it was that whole idea of he kind of but wants he, to treat her. He doesn't her. know that. Right. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know that. Right. None of them know that. None of them have right. been kids. Right. You know? And so right. I think that's a big, it, it, you know, you have to step back from it and look at like, they've never had a childhood. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the only reason that cut knows that is yep. because he has children. Yep. Right. And so when he steps in that that's that was the really impactful moment for me is when he steps in like showing him how a kid needs to be treated and that's one of those things that as a father you know my my poor oldest child is our experiment right she's the she's the one that we've 
tried everything out on and you know she had a, a very regimented schedule when she was a baby and she you know and all of these things that are eight forget about it <laughs> like she's she does whatever the heck it is that she wants to do and um and it's not because she's the baby and she's just gonna walk all over us but we just know okay this is not a battle that's worth fighting you know it, it's just not mm-hmm. at the, the hospital uh instruct like taught us to if she was asleep didn't matter like wake noel up so that she's eating every two hours, has to eat every two hours. When we were dying because of that, because we were told to do that, um, it was hilarious because my wife lamented and mentioned it to her uh, at the time, like 85-year-old Italian grandmother who was like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> would you do that? <laughs> Let them sleep, you know? Yeah. And so Renata, like it's, it's it, but, but the true, like you know, she's very different, you know? And so I, I think that's such an amazing point where it's like, uh, you know, seeing cut, uh, what really struck me was, I mean, I, I have had, I mean, not, nobody's perfect, but like my, I've had no enormously significant issues with my dad, you know, and I know a lot of people have, um, and I've known, I, I've seen some very close friends of mine and family members of mine who had even a terrible experience or no experience at all, who praise God, you know, like they're, they're somehow their response to grace and their own choices in their life have put them in a place where they are so determined to do it right now Mm -hmm. that, that out of that very sorrow and tort and trauma, God's bringing about this, this goodness where they're, they're out there kind of without a net because they don't have anything to draw from. Um, But maybe you had a wonderful father and then you drop the ball, you know? And so it's because everybody has to make their own decision. So I think this is a really neat way to have cut, here same boat as them in some respect like like you were just saying you know to to like they didn't even have a childhood you know their clothes you know but to be able to to uh fraternally correct each other or to show each other you know that there's a lot more to learn than just warfare you know this is a different kind of warfare <laughs> you know and, and i thought i thought there were some for a very short episode compared to episode one mm-hmm. i thought we we didn't get so much plot track, you know, or, or kind of traction maybe um, in terms of storyline maybe. But, but I think the, the building blocks I felt like were for future development are really being put there in a, in a pretty cool way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think uh, the encounter with cut and cut and Sue and their family was, was a necessary first step. It, I mean, they, they frame it in the plot wise as this is, this is the logical next step is to reach out to cut and Sue. But I think, you know, in just in terms of, of where they're going to go with the story and, and the relationship, um, you know, I think it was definitely a, a, a good thing. You could also look at, um, this episode from the theme of belonging too, because, um, Omega is a kid and she's trying to figure out where does she belong? Um, she, I think on Camino, she definitely didn't feel like she belonged with anyone there. Um, definitely being a female human, but also just being a very different clone. Um, and she felt like she did belong with clone force 99. And then Hunter was sort of telling her, no, you don't belong with us. So, um, we, we saw when she kind of you know, quote unquote, messed up that she went after the ball and um, got a talking to that she actually took off this headpiece that she has. She took it off and she doesn't have it on for the rest of the episode. So I'm wondering, what does that mean? You know, what what is that headpiece and what is the significance of it? And then also, you know, that can tell us more about what was going through her mind um, at that time. But I think ultimately it has to do with belonging and where she fits in. Um, and for um, for Cut and Sue and their family, you know, again, with the refugee concept that they they belong together and they belong somewhere that's safe. And they obviously can't do that on this planet. So they don't belong on this planet. Um And I thought that was very interesting, too, because you get the sense that, you know, Cut, he at one point he tells Hunter like something about basically um, setting aside being a soldier and and putting down roots or something like that. And it was along those lines. Um, So you get his concept of like coming from being a soldier and belonging to you know, whatever your, your clone force, you know, whatever your troop is to then 
belonging to a family and how he felt like that was more for him. Uh, whereas I think Hunter would definitely feel like CF-99 is where he belongs. You know, so this concept of belonging, um, at the very beginning of the episode, I always pay attention to what is said. And at the beginning of this episode, they have this conversation, um, Echo and Tech. And Echo says, you know, why is this guy all the way out here? And Tech says, well, he's a deserter. Um, and he's like, uh, you trust a deserter? And Tech says, why not? We're all deserters now. Um, and I thought that was actually, it was funny, but it was also so profound because um, it's this idea that, you know, um, who do you trust? Um, Star Wars, I often bring up, brings in kind of like the what's in the political zeitgeist at the time that whatever piece of Star Wars is created, you know, and refugees and immigration is a big uh, topic nowadays in the United States. Um, it always has been, right? But especially uh, the last 10, 15, 20 years and um, the idea of trusting someone who sort of goes off. Um, but I think that they very much sort of took the lens of uh, cut is doing what is best for him and for his family. And that could happen to anybody, you know, anybody could be displaced, anybody could encounter, you know, a threat to their family, and wanting to do the best thing for their family. So I just thought that was all like very much encapsulated in this small, you know, um, exchange. In the in, obviously in the context of, of this episode. So that was another thing that I really appreciated about this episode. Yeah, and I and I and I really like that uh, that comparison to uh, the Bad Batch Clone Force ninety nine. I mean, they're they're not really Clone Force ninety nine anymore. I mean, they're not really they're not a they're not part of the Clone Troopers. And that was that was very clear in the first episode is that they are, yeah, they are deserters uh, in a, in other words. So you know, so part of this too is is them. Uh, I mean, perhaps even looking at Cut and Sue and how with how they're trying to take care of their family and they have to ask the same questions about them and what is best for them and whether that means they need to continue to be troopers or whether they need to be something different, you know. And so I, I suspect we'll see that kind of play out, um, you know, as we go along. And, you know, they, <laughs> there is the question, <laughs> what are they going to do for, you know, where 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 are they going, you know, as as. uh you know, are they just going to kind of lay, lay low? And I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> you know, this is not that kind of show where <laughs> we're going to go see them start to plant crops and, and, you know, homestead somewhere. Uh, they're going to get wrapped up in, in some of the bigger issues, but still they have to figure out who they are as their identity because they are no longer clone troopers, quote unquote, they are something different. When inside of that, you have some a couple of very interesting characters you have first off omega who's we've got to figure out how she's fitting into everything but then you have echo who's sitting on the fringe of all of this like they're all you know enhanced clones and he's just a clone with some extra gear you know on him and uh i think that i i hope they play that up a little more because that's that's one of the things that i really started feeling for him and how he fits in the group because he's new, because he's not really the same quality of clone as they are, the, that he's going to have to find his place in the group as well. Yeah, all all good things that um, hopefully we get to see play out. Any kind of final thoughts or comments on either either episodes? I'm really loving Hunter's um, Hunter's character development. Like he he's the father figure. I think really. Um, kind of like in the Mandalorian. Yes, I do see that connection. Um, but it just, yeah, it, how they're developing him and how they're very, being very intentional about what he says and how he looks at certain issues and situations and, um, and really kind of having these kind of side conversations too with different characters um it's obvious to me that you know him being the leader of this bad batch that he's going to be very important um and his character development is going to be very important so i'm really enjoying that a lot 
The only thing I wanted to add was just, again, like we, we brought this up in different ways before, but just more of like the, the production quality and the behind the scenes of, of um, just the, the craftsmanship of it, you know? Um, and, and I, <laughs> I wish I could, I do have all, one last thing about the music I wanted to say, but I'm just laughing because one of my notes here, I didn't see till we sat down and started recording. It's under this category and it, there's a little dash and then it says capital L capital I and then it's nothing. And I'm like, what? Because what happened was probably I sat down and started to make a note and then something happened like in the house, you know, with a, <laughs> a bait, like we're not climbing into the dishwasher again or something, you know, like, no, 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 no. So I don't know what that was, but if I think of it, I'll mention it next, next time. But the uh, Kevin Kiner's score father mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for me personally, I don't know what it was exactly. I want to go back and try to catch it, but uh, episode two, especially, I felt like the the music in episode two, and and, and I was just really noticing like you know camera angles, fade ins, and and just like you know uh, blurring the background at certain points, and and just and this is you know there aren't real cameras. Mm-hmm. You know what right. I mean? Like every, right. It's like the, every little cell is done on purpose to try to make it look like something George would have made. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I and I think that that is just done so well. The only thing that I had to laugh a little bit because I just I, I didn't really get it. I wasn't sure what they were going for when they get back to Camino. I think it was to 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 rescue Omega, and they get captured by Tarkin. The last little like two seconds as that scene is closing there's this weird almost like sax riff that was i don't know <laughs> it, it was it sounded weirder the second time because it just stuck in my head and i just kept i got my brain is wrecked because i imagine like you'd see kenny g like off in the side <laughs> you know because it just i didn't really get that like what the <laughs> it seems bib you know. for tuna and his band no. <laughs> yeah it, it was it was one of those things where it just kind of catches you off guard like uh some of the like the electric guitar riffs in episode two and the chase yeah. scene which which fits but it's just a little different you're like that's that's different, you know. So that was the only one I was like, that's weird. But uh, no, just the music, everything, it just, it felt, it felt like original trilogy type stuff to me in some ways. Like it fits there, you know, it's before that, but it's, it's like, that's where we're headed. Well, in the first episode in general, it just felt like a mini movie, which was also yeah, really, really cool. did. Yeah. 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 It didn't feel like, to me, it didn't feel like three episodes kind of smashed together. Mm-hmm. Um inorganically it was it was really i think very intentional about the structure and the pacing and everything and even the second episode fits so much into that you know it's it's back to that clone the 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 way they did the clone wars everything they could just pack so much into those 30 minute shows and um you know we're definitely holding that tradition here because there's just a lot in there do you guys know is it tom kane who does the the voiceover at the beginning yeah i just wanted to point that out because he had was it a stroke? Passed or, away. Um, yeah. No. Right? I think he. he? I think, oh, no. He I think didn't he pass a, away. I think he had a stroke or something and it was going to yeah. prevent his. Uh, I just wanted to point that out because I. Th- um, yeah. He had lost the ability to use his voice. Right. 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 Is that yeah. what it was? Yep. Yeah. He, he had a stroke. Um, okay. Yeah. So I. I guess I am unsure if this was recorded by him before the stroke or I know he's, he's been recovering. I think it was. Um, he's been recovering well. And I, th- I thought I read somewhere that he was going to get back into doing some voice work, but um, cool. either way, it was good to hear him. And I know that, that, mm. you know, so keep, keep him and his recovery in your prayers yet. I believe, did he not also, cause he did other voices. I, th- yep. I think he did the voice of Yoda he did. Uh, for a lot. He, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. he did a cameo for us and included a bunch of those. He did some of the droids. Mm-hmm. He did Yoda. He did. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Oh yep. my gosh. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. So yeah, he's, he's done a lot of different voice, uh, mm-hmm. voice work for star Wars. So I'll pray for Tom Kane. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, that is it from us listeners. Uh, definitely let us know what you thought of the, the premiere episode of, and the second episode of the bad batch. Uh, we would really love to, to hear your thoughts and, uh, get your take on it and start that dialogue, um, out there in social media. So you can email us at star Wars at sqpn.com, or you can comment on our Facebook or Twitter page. Um, our Facebook page is facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, and you can find us on Twitter at SQPN. 
We would like to take a moment now, of course, to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Wars, including Daniel S., Denise I., Joseph L., Luis D., and Michael C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Wars and all the shows that we do here at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, of course, be sure to subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, your favorite podcast player so you don't miss an episode. You can also find us on YouTube. Just search for the SQPN YouTube channel and click the bell to get notifications for new episodes. And you can find any and all previous episodes of The Secrets of Star Wars by going to sqpn.com slash Star Wars. Also, we know how cool t-shirts are, and now you can get the official Secrets of Star Wars t-shirt. We have a t-shirt for the show that encapsulates our philosophy of finding hope in a galaxy far, far away, and it is available in various styles and sizes, and they do look pretty fantastic. So you can get your shirt by going to sqpn.com slash merch. And we will be back next week as we will take a deeper look at episode three of The Bad Batch. So make sure that you are keeping up on the show on Disney Plus and then you're joining us for a fun, deep discussion just a few days later. So until next time, Angela Cialana, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Wars. It was fun. Thank you. And Thomas Sanherjo, thanks for joining us this evening as well. It's been a pleasure. And Mike Creevy, thank you as well for joining us. Fun as always. And once again, I'm Father Andrew Kinstetter. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. <laughs>